Ezra Levant from the Rebel.media here in The Hague, the capital city of the Netherlands. Behind me, the Parliament buildings. Inside there is Geert Wilders, the leader of the Party for Freedom, an insurgent party that is now leading the polls here in the mold of Nigel Farage's UKIP in the United Kingdom and Donald Trump in the United States. I sat down with Geert Wilders for half an hour. We talked about radical Islam, free speech, the European Union, and other issues. Here's that interview. Mr. Wilders, thank you so much for uh, meeting with us. It's just three weeks till the election. Yes. Uh, tell me uh, how the Party for Freedom is doing. First, um, um, let me welcome you and thank you for this interview, Ezra. Well. It's an honor uh, to be on your uh, show as I was a few years ago. I remember very well in, uh, thank you. in Canada, and I wish there were more Canadians with the guts that you have. Well, in Holland, we have elections in uh, three weeks' time. And we are doing uh, quite well. It's, it's tough. It's only three weeks. We are now with um, um, almost equal uh, when it comes to the uh, polling uh, with the party of the prime minister, the liberal party, a more liberal conservative party. But still, it's, it's, um, 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 it's a fight. And um, well, there is a lot of turmoil. So I'm going to my, um, um, it looks quite good. But my problem, if I have a problem, is that I have to get my voters to go and vote. That is the most important thing because we gain from all parties, but mostly from the non-voters. People mm -hmm. are dissatisfied by the current parties and the current elite. So if I manage to get my people to go and vote, I will have a very good success. Uh, but if they stay home, um, it will be different. So uh, that is what I should do in the next three weeks. Tell people, come on, these are historical elections. Go and vote and, um, and get our Netherlands uh, back. That's, uh, that's my motto. Uh, do you think that Dutch people are inspired by the Brexit referendum and the Donald Trump election? Uh, does that give people more <coughs> courage to uh, dissent? Well, you know, it's what I call uh, the patriotic spring. People, um, as I said, feel misrepresented by the current political parties, by the current elite, who feel that uh, multiculturalism, uh, mass immigration, um, Islamization, or the fact that we and transferred our national sovereignty to this institution called the European Union and Brussels and we don't even have the key of our own front door and cannot decide um, who we let enter into our country or when people should leave. Uh, people are fed up with that arrogance of the political elite and indeed um, and people see that in the United Kingdom um, despite all the fear mongering from the elite from both Brussels and London that the economy would go down, that the, would, the lights would go out, that there probably would be a war in Europe, that it's not happening. The country is happening. A strong economy, uh, a free trade deal um, with um, um, the United States, probably even before the European Union uh, will have it. Um, so it's, it's far better than everybody predicted. And this, of course, is an incentive. It's not um, about uh, Mr. Trump personally or the United Kingdom personally, but people seeing that despite um, the fear-mongering from the current uh, political leaders, they can um, uh, take charge and they are stronger and they can put the faith of their own country in their own hands again. And that indeed, all over the European Union, is very inspiring. But the forces against us are um, um, very strong and growing uh, as well. Uh, I think that the greatest challenge to both Brexit and Donald Trump were not politicians, was not Hillary Clinton, but rather the media establishment, the political establishment, even the legal establishment. What is it like in the Netherlands? Are there any establishment uh, forces, any media that are supportive of you, or are they all critical uh, or overwhelmingly critical? Well, of course, there are few uh, exceptions, but 98% is very strong against. And the elite, as I call them, um, it's not indeed um, only the politicians, it's uh, the media, it's also the top, um, uh, the representatives of the, of, the, of the Catholic churches or other churches, um, it's um, uh, the intellectuals, it's all the people who um, um, are really lost any touch with the common people and fear for their own position, um, are based um, and driven only by uh, multiculturalism. And, 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 and don't see that um, if we continue by, for instance, the Islamization of our society, that they will pay the first price, you know? I mean, this is uh, what at stake is at stake today. It's our mere um, existence that is at stake. It's not like we are facing an economical crisis that you can beat if you have a good policy like small government or lower taxes. No, it's the existential problem. When I go to America or Canada, 
I always tell my friends there, listen, um, um, you are bordering, at least the United States is bordering Mexico. We are bordering, our continent that is bordering Europe is Africa, it's the Middle East. And the African um, 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 inhabitants, the African people will explode in this century. You know, they have one billion people living in Africa today. According to the United Nations, at the end of the century, it will be quadrupled to four billion people. Where at the same time, the European um, amount of people will diminish. So four billion people, one third of them, even today, is planning uh, to um, emigrate to Europe, which means that what we saw happening with the asylum crisis, um, with people from Syria and Libya um, coming to Europe, that we haven't seen anything yet. One billion people, mostly um, from Islamic backgrounds, will come um, to Europe uh, in this century, which means that, um, and Islam, once again, is not there to assimilate or to integrate. That is the biggest mistake we made, open borders and no demands on new immigrants to assimilate and to integrate. We will cease to exist. And the whole elite um, is not willing or capable because they invented the concept of multiculturalism and open border policy. Um, so they are, they are fighting it, but they are fighting against our mere existence. And um, the people are finally waking up because they saw in the last few years, both with the European Union and with the asylum crisis, that we only import more terrorism, more um, um, intolerance, uh, more uh, violence, and that it should stop. Uh, just coming in today, we landed at the Amsterdam airport. Uh, we took the train here to The Hague. You can see visually there's so many Muslim people, uh, women wearing hijabs, things like that. Uh, is it past the point of no return? E even if you were to win and you were to stop new immigration, how deep are the roots of Islam and the Islamification? What, what is the number? Is it even possible to win if there's a voter block out there that's yeah. against you? Well, in Holland, we have now approximately, um, out of a population of 17, one seven, 17 million people, 1 million Muslims, um, which is something like 6%. Um, and I believe it can be stopped. You know, um, 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 as Winston Churchill said, um, never give in, never give up, never, 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 ever do that. And it is possible, you know. If we should, um, not only for what is happening today, but what I just told you about what will happen with the explosion of the uh, demographics in Africa and the Arab world, um, if we should finally um, um, close our borders, and as a Dutchman I have to say we cannot do that inside the European Union because we transferred our sovereign right of immigration and um, um, our own border policy to Brussels. So we have to get rid of Brussels as the United Kingdom did to control our own borders again. And if we would do that, if we would finally decide ourselves who to allow inside our country and who not, and how long people can stay. And if we at the same time, for the people who are already in our country, would say uh, the good days are over. Um, if you adapt and assimilate um, to our values, our constitution, you are not only equal as anybody else, but you are welcome to stay. But if you start acting according to Sharia law uh, and try to um, do, um, um, use violence or terroristic threats or whatever, we will strip you of the Dutch nationality and send you outside our country. If we would at least start those two things, um, then um, a lot of things um, really would change. Mm -hmm. The problem is more that if we don't do it, that we stay into the European Union, and once again, again, the European Union is not only incapable to close its border, but also unwilling. You know, and I'm not, I'm not personally blaming all those Muslims coming um, to Europe. Perhaps if I was a Muslim from Africa, I would do the same, to ask for a better life for myself and my family. But I blame the political leaders who allow them to come. This was the toxic combination of Europe in the last few decades, open border policy with not one single demand of assimilation and integration. And if you then don't get people from Mexico, but people with an Islamic ideology, um, it's not only toxic, once again, it's a matter of our existence. We cease to exist, our culture cease to exist at the end of the century if we don't act now. And yes, it can be reversed, but we have to start acting today. Are there Muslim liberals, Muslim reformists who support you? <laughs> well, um, um, some are, but they are more uh, former uh, Muslims, so um, apostates, people who left Islam. And then um, even there are not uh, too many within the Muslim community, there are some people who are um, a little bit tough, but uh, the majority is not speaking out. Mm -hmm. You know, I always said, after any attack, both uh, in Holland when um, uh, 
um, um, Theo van Gogh was murdered, but also in the rest of Europe, where were all those mass demonstrations of Muslims who um, should say, this is not our Islam. Mm -hmm. um, it's big silence um, every time again. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a few um, um, that uh, might be uh, vocal, but um, um, you hardly hear them. You have been prosecuted numerous times, not by a Sharia court, but by the Dutch courts. Yeah. And you've been convicted. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, it seems to me that that, that that has rebounded against the courts, that people uh, sense that that was an unfairness and a politicization of the courts. Uh, is that a correct observation? That's very correct. Indeed, they, um, in many countries they tried um, to get me to court. Jordan tried to get me to court. Um, um, the Iranian government, after Fitna, wanted to get me to court. At the end of the day, they didn't. The Indonesian government called me persona non grata for my life. Um, um, and that is everything to be expected, you know, Islamic non-democracies. But hey, um, here was my own country um, um, with um, supposedly a rule of law. Uh, we have a rule of law. And then I was taken to court for saying something about Moroccans. And Moroccans, I asked the people if they wanted more or less Moroccans. And everybody knew the context. Moroccans are of the Dutch um, um, people who go to fight in Syria, to fight jihad with the Islamic State, 78% um, um, of them are Moroccans. Moroccans are 22 times overrepresented in the crime st statistics when it comes to crimes on the street or whatever. So um, it was politicized, you know. Uh, I am a leader of the opposition. Uh, the elite, which is also ju ju uh, judiciary, is part of the elite. They convicted me because, uh, uh, which is not even part of our law, so I'm the first one that's convicted uh, out of some kind of jurisprudence also from Europe, but not according to the Dutch law. They said that according to them, a nationality has to be seen as a race. So um, as far as I know, and as far as also the Dutch people know, and they don't understand the verdict, whatever you think about my opinions, um, Moroccans are no race, it's a nationality. It's like you say, I want more or less Mexicans. You're not talking about all the Mexicans, but you want less Mexicans. Um, so indeed, um, this was um, not a very popular verdict. I will t appeal to it as well, um, because people didn't understand. They knew just before the elections, a popular politician, and then a verdict about race that, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not a racist. And I was speaking about a nationality. Uh, in Canada right now, there yeah. is a motion before our parliament uh, that calls the, on the government to, quote, eliminate Islamophobia. But it doesn't define Islamophobia. No. Uh, what do you think the risks are if that becomes a sort of law to eliminate Islamophobia? What could go wrong? Well, everything could go wrong, especially if you don't define it. I can predict you that all those kangaroo courts, as you have as well as we do, um, will uh, make sure that everything um, falls under the definition of Islamophobia. So what it actually means is that the, the multiculturalist, the cultural relativist, that they end the freedom of speech. That if you um, start talking um, uh, and speaking out your mind and um, 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 uh, tell um, um, the worries about millions of your countrymen, whether you're a journalist or a politician, that you will be stopped. You, you either will be taken uh, uh, to a civil court, um, as your experience, or to a criminal court, as I experience, so it's the end of freedom of speech. And it's the current elite that is not defending our values, that is not defending our freedom of speech, but is helping the Islamization and end our freedom. And let me tell you, um, um, it's, it's, it's happening all over the Western world, that at the end of the day, if Islam becomes more prominent, and it will, because criticism about the Islamic ideology will be stopped, they will take it to courts and do everything, that at the end of the day, people will find out that Islam and freedom are incompatible. So we are not only losing our freedom and our freedom of speech, but we are letting an ideology, a totalitarian ideology win that at the end of the day will kill us all, whether or not our ideology, then in persons, if they get their way. Look at all these societies today where Islam um, is already dominant in the Middle East, you see that there is a total lack of um, civil society, of rule of law, of a middle class, that journalists, apostates, Christians, homosexuals within a society are unfree and often punished until the moment of death. And 
that is not something we should import. You should be able to criticize that to, um, in order to let our country stay free. Mm. And by um, so-called fighting Islamophobia, they let Islam win and end our freedom. And that is why we have to stand up and fight it politically, um, in uh, the press and everywhere, despite the repercussions. Uh, our Canadian state broadcaster a couple of days ago referred to you as far right. Now, if you're <coughs> leading the polls, I don't know how that's even statistically possible. But your other issues, whether it's gay rights or feminism or even issues yep. like drug use or prostitution, how would you characterize yourself? Would you, is this even a left-right issue? Are you a social liberal? No, it's, it's not. You know, I don't like being labeled. You know, our, the Dutch Prime Minister, my competitor in the elections now, always calls me the most leftish person in Holland. Really? Because of our social policy. Ah. <laughs> because we believe, we are not socialist, but um, we believe that um, cuts when it comes to the homes of the elderly, uh, cuts when it comes to our public health system, cuts when it comes to all the things that the normal common people have to endure. You know, remember, we are also beside the European Union, we are also a member of the Eurozone. And in the last few years, we had billions, in the last seven years, 50 billion austerity measures in Holland. People's pensions were cut, the public health were cut, the taxes were raised. And at the same time, the people saw that we sent billions of Dutch euros to countries like Greece and, and other countries, that we spent billions of euros to people who came to Holland as so-called asylum seekers, which were mostly young men traveled through six, seven, eight countries to come here in Holland because of a big fat welfare state. And people are dissatisfied mm. with that. And we say, stop, we are first elected um, um, to take care of our own people. And I cannot explain that we sent uh, money for extra pensions to Greece and we have to cut the pensions of the Dutch people. So um, I'm criticized in Holland uh, for being left. Um, I'm not left. We are winning by uh, some votes from the left. So I don't like to be labeled. We might be cultural conservative, uh, but when it comes to the left, you know, um, we win from, from left, from right, from non-voters, um, because we have the combination of, um, um, at one hand, cultural conservatism, but on the second hand, choosing for our own people instead of anybody else. I want to talk a little bit more about women's rights and gay rights. Yeah. Uh, in the past, in the recent past, uh, separation of church and state, um, feminism, were powerful ideas of the left. But w where is the left? Where are feminists, where are gay rights activists on separation of mosque and state? Yeah. What, do you, can you help me understand, what's your observation in, in the Netherlands? Why are people who spoke bravely against the Christian church meek in the face of Islam? Yes. First, because they are very afraid. They are not brave and they are cowards. Secondly, because what you mentioned before, they are getting more and more dependent on their vote. You know, the second city of the Netherlands um, is Rotterdam, after Amsterdam of Rotterdam, and in the last uh, elections of the Rotterdam municipality, um, the left won because of the Muslim vote. They got the, the majority because of them. And um, 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 uh, that was huge. Uh, and you see it happening as well all over. So the people who invented uh, the multiculturalism in Holland, the people who cherish the cultural relativism, the biggest disease we are facing for so long now in Europe, people who are afraid to say that our culture based on Christianity and Judaism on humanism is far better than the Islamic um, ideology. You are not a, a bigot or a racist if you say um, the Arab world says nothing else. Um, in their countries. At least that we could learn uh, from them. But we are not even doing that. So the cultural relativists who invented it, they are unable to say we were wrong. We were wrong by getting all those people here and not demanding that we treat women equally, that we don't beat up gays, that we have a separation of church and state. They were unable to do that. And they still are, because then they have to admit that they made an enormous mistake. And secondly, they are depending on their vote. So um, the people, have to change it. The politicians won't. All across the West, there's a belief in freedom of religion. Uh, is Islam more than just a religion? Well, Islam is not a religion. Now, I know it sounds crazy, um, and I know I don't get a lot of support for that idea, but I strongly believe that Islam 
might be dressed up as a religion. It has a holy book, it has a temple, it looks like a religion. But it, it's more um, 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 an ideology and a totalitarian ideology than a religion. You cannot compare it with Christianity or Judaism. Um, you should compare it with other totalitarian ideologies like communism or fascism. And I always use one example to prove it. There are many more that like in communism and fascism, the penalty is death if you want to leave it. I mean, you cannot leave Islam. If you're an apostate, if you're a renegade, the penalty is death. And even today, in our societies, let alone in the Islamic societies, um, it is enacted upon. You know, people are killed for that reason. Um, you can leave Christianity. You can leave Judaism. So, um, um, and the other point is that Islam wants to rule. The word, as you know, Islam means to subjugate. Wants to rule and dominate and subjugate not only a person's life, but also a whole society. You know, the role of God, the role of, of Allah, the role of the Quran and the Hadith is is the role of the society. You know, they are not, I'm not talking about all Muslims, I'm talking about the ideology. And the ide ideology cannot integrate and assimilate in a society. It wants to dominate it and wants to subjugate with violence. The Quran is full of more violence and anti-Semitism than Mein Kampf, uh, for instance. People, um, um, academics um, have proved that. So our biggest mistake is, once again, um, the false equality that we say that Islam is a religion, so um, we ha they have the freedom of religion. And I believe it's not a religion, it should not be treated as a religion, and the constitutional freedoms of religion do not apply uh, to an ideology. We would not allow in Holland uh, Nazi schools, uh, for instance. It's another totalitarian ideology. Why do we have Islamic schools? Why young children in five, six, seven, eight, that years old, that we want to, uh, to integrate, get a job, get Dutch friends, participate fully and equally in the Dutch society, are being taught up with the Quran and an ideology of hate um, um, uh, towards everything that is um, what we believe in. That's the wrong thing. We should not apply to it. But people say, no, it's the freedom of religion, it's the freedom of, of education, and you should allow all it. It will, at the end of the day, as I said, um, um, and make sure that we have lost our existential rights. We should stand up and be tolerant to the people or ideologies that are tolerant to us, but finally start becoming intolerant to the people and ideologies that are intolerant to us. And um, the last thing, um, um, everybody forgot, unfortunately. Are there other countries in Europe or elsewhere in the world that are a role model for you? What, what do you think of Hungary, for example? What do you think of Eastern European countries? Well, um, I met Mr. Orban not so long ago, uh, half a year ago, privately, and um, well, I think he's a hero. I think he, he's the one um, um, that says that um, um, my country is a Christian country and I don't want it to be Islamized. My women and daughters will not be raped or, 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 or whatever, insulted in the streets of Budapest or Pech or Miskolc or any other. Hungarian country. We will not do that. And Europe, forget it. Um, they will not do that. And listen, the former Eastern European countries, when it comes to immigration, they are more our allies today than the Western European countries. Uh, like the Czech Republic, like Poland, like um, um, Slovakia, Romania, Hungary. They know what totalitarianism looks like. They've seen it. They've been under the umbrella of Moscow. And now we have Brussels. And of course, I'm not saying that Brussels is exactly the same as the communist empire and the USSR, but still it has also some totalitarianism inside. And they know that they don't want that again. And they stand up and they say, we don't want this kind of immigration and asylum seekers. We don't want um, our culture to be eroded by a culture of violence. They don't want to leave the European Union as we do because they earn a lot of money because of that. The Dutch are the biggest um, um, net uh, pay us per capita to the European Union, and they are the big, biggest receivers. Mm -hmm. So um, um, you will not hear them um, to ask them to leave the European Union, but they say stop, no more immigration, no more asylum seekers. We are a Christian country and we want to stay a Christian country. And for that, they can be and have to be applauded. They are more heroes than the rest of the Western European leaders uh, together. And Mr. Orban is a very good example. I think he's a very strong politician. I, I want to try and make a connection between freedom of speech, um, Donald Trump, 
and speaking critically of Islam. One of the things that surprised so many political observers about Donald Trump was that he didn't care about political correctness. He would say things that were shocking to the political classes, but ordinary people said right on. Even if he went a little bit too far, I think they liked that. Uh, do you think that people in Holland, people in the Netherlands, are sick of being told what to think and say and what words to use? Do you think there's a resentment to this word policing, or do you think people are just keeping their head down and not wanting to, to get into trouble? Well, I know Holland is, is not America, um, um, but still, you're all right, that, um, and that's what I liked for the first time, whatever you think of Mr. Trump, there was a politician that made some promises, and he actually fulfills, at least tries to fulfill his promises. And the whole world was shocked um, because the guy just did what he promised to do, which is today, and it says more about politics than about Mr. Trump, it's very uncommon, very unusual. P politicians promise a lot of things, and at the end of the day, they fulfill nothing. <laughs> and um, in Holland, um, it, 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 it might be part of our system because we don't have a two-party system and we have to make coalitions with five, six other parties. Um, but in America, in the two-party system, he is just doing what he promised to do. But what about, the, what about the fact that he, I think, encouraged ordinary Americans to say, I'm not going to uh, yeah. be quiet anymore. I'm going to say yes. what I feel about immigration, yes. about Islam, about Mexico, and I'm not going to be shushed well, anymore. No, that's what a lot of people indeed like, both when it comes to uh, free trade and the American jobs, uh, both when it comes to indeed uh, immigration and Mexicans, both when it comes to the um, um, Islamic countries and its policy towards that. Uh, and you see, there is a lot of, in, in Holland we see most of the time all the resistance in courts and rallies against them. But if you know America, you know America better than I do, but if you travel to America, you see that there is also a lot of support. There are lots of people, as you say, that believe that the guy is trying to do what he believes. And once again, whatever you think about his policy, um, he is, um, um, in a way, uh, doing what a lot of people, even within the Grand Old Party, the Republican Party, um, uh, missed um, in former governments, even when they were in charge. You know, it's like, in a way, without a total comparison, the old Reagan times um, um, revive. And I believe it's a good thing. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Do you think people will wake up in time, or will it be too late? Well, you know, um, I'm an optimist. I would not um, um, sit here um, with everything my country and I personally have endured in the last years with losing my freedom and everything, taken to court, all these threats by this terrible Islamic organization. I have to be, and I really am an optimist. And even if I would lose the elections, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the genie will not go back into the bottle again. Of course I want to, and I'm very confident, to win the elections. But, you know, the, the discontent of the people who sense for the first time that their existence is at stake, don't forget, only in the, in the last year, 2016, all over Europe there were terroristic attacks, sometimes twice a day in Germany. We saw it in so many countries happening. People know that Islam and immigration, they don't hate Muslims, neither do I, but they know that the open door policy and sending our money there and the cultural relativism is at the end of the day not a good thing. And they will not stop. Um, the only danger is that the current elite tries, as they often try to do, to adapt in our way uh, or fool the people by just changing the policy for 10% and then at the end of the day return back to their old customs. And we need a revolution. We need a, um, a, a, a democratic, non-violent, but we need a revolution. We need a revolution from the people um, to stop the elite from continuing what they are doing, which is killing our countries. Well, here's what I'm worried about is as the courts and the media and the politicians and the police say you're not allowed to criticize, as they drive people out of the establishment, if people can't express themselves politically, if they can't see su success, I'm worried that people will go to violence. People might even return to fascism that Europe saw 80 years ago. I'm worried that by marginalizing cr good faith critics, Leftists are actually creating a, a worse response to radical Islam. Donald Trump is peaceful. Nigel Farage is peaceful. Marine Le Pen is peaceful. Frau Capet, you're peaceful. 
if people can't have a peaceful solution, is there a risk of violence? Well, you know, that's why they should cherish us. Because, as you rightfully said, if people like my party or the UK party or Le Pen's party, if they would not be there, what would be alternative? At least we are canalizing in a democratic, non-violent way um, 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 the concerns of so many people. I'm an optimist. I believe in the rule of law. I believe in non-violence. And I believe it's still possible um, to change things. So um, um, I will not go into what would happen if we won't get our way, because um, I believe in the non-violent democratic way. And we are, um, 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 we are still at the point that what you asked me before, yes, it can be changed. And it's tough. And the closer we come, and the more people support us, the more the elite, the journalists, the courts, the politicians, the churches will fight us. You are right there, because they know they are losing ground. And that at least is a positive thing, how strange it may sound, if we would be unimportant and marginalized and representing 0.1% of the people, they would not be concerned. They are concerned. They are cornered and they are afraid. And we have not to step back or use violence, but we have to um, 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 work even a little bit harder um, to get more people behind us in a demographic, non-violent way and accept that the battle, um, the democratical battle, will be tough. And as you said, they will, uh, whether it's in your country with Islamophobia or my country by pe uh, taking people to court or trying to adapt a, a part of the policy, they will try every trick in the book and we have to stay on track and fight them for the people and the freedom of our countries. Here, Wilders, thank you very much for your time. And it's good luck pleasure. in the election. Thank you so much. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Ezra. That's our interview with Geert Wilders, an interview that the mainstream media would either not do or do as an attack interview. They hate Geert Wilders and his ideas. If you believe in our independent journalism, please help us. The cost of this trip for myself and two cameramen was $7,000, a rounding error for the CBC, but a lot of money for us. If you can help, please go to rebeleurope.com. Thanks very much.